Thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, that award, kind of interesting. You get something like that and then you give a tour and, and you get to take that tour out and show people your mistakes and, and your train wrecks in three years of travel. And, and, but uh, that's ultimately that's what complex systems are about, is making mistakes and learning from them. I want to thank um, Robbie and Pat. It, as a speaker, you're always worried that what you're going to say is relevant. And, and Robbie brought up a couple subjects. Uh, first one is, is the role of science and management in complex systems, uh, range systems, also water cycle. Um, ecosystem services that ranchers provide, and, and then Pat mentioned this concept that you can have your cake and eat it too, that, that you don't have to compromise ag production for ecosystem health, and, and I'm going to make the argument that you need to ag production for ecosystem health. So, so they sort of touched on those topics from, I think, more of a social policy point of view, and, and I'm going to get those topics, some of them pretty heavily, from a producer on, on a single production. As again, one more thing to sort of preface what I'm going to say. I was driving up uh, actually the day before yesterday to give this talk and, and listening to a guy, uh, and I, I can never say his name right, but it's, it's Paulette Nicholas Salim, or Salim Nicholas Paulette. He's a writer, he wrote a book called The Black Swan. He now has a book out called Anti-Fragile. And it's not the Black Swan movie. Uh, it, it's, <clears throat> his picture of the world is that these, these unpredictable events essentially drive our world in all realms. And, and he is especially, uh, he's an economist and he, and he works in, in probability, he's a mathematician. And he's, if nothing else, he's very controversial. He's not afraid to speak his mind. One of the points he made though, about economic systems, specifically um, the option side of the economic systems, is that the guys who drive progress in terms of, of learning how to deal with the complexity of economic systems are the guys with skin in the game. They're the traders that are down there on the floor that are using these very strange option instruments to make a living or to go broke. And, and I think there's a correlation in rangeland systems. This goes to the point that Robbie touched on. Um, producers aren't, and in my mind, and I think this is really critical, we're not managing the system from outside the system. We are part of the ecosystem. And, and so our, when we make mistakes, and if we make too many mistakes in a row, we're gone. Natural selection works on ranches. And so all, a lot of the controversy about grazing protocols and those kind of things, it struck me listening to Caleb that, you know what? I've been doing some of the stuff I've been doing for 17 years, and, and it turned my operation around, and I'm still doing it, and I'm still here. So I don't need to justify to anybody that it works. I just need to keep doing it. I just need to keep functioning within that ecosystem. And, and so what, what I want to try to do today is, is talk about a couple things. I've, I've been through three of the worst years I, I hope that I will ever see. Uh, starting in 2011, southeast Colorado, less than five inches of, of total precip in 2011-2012, less than three inches of total precip until late July of 2013. Then we had two big rainstorms, rained like two inches in an hour both times, and we all left. So, so we're still, we're in the third, end of the third going on the fourth year of drought, and, and that's the main thing we're going to talk about is um, some mistakes I've made and, and how I've adapted to that throughout the environment. I'm going to, I've spent too long on the introduction, so I'm going to have to go a little quick in spots. But uh, <clears throat> those of you who haven't heard me talk um, or haven't seen, there, there's an article in the Rangelands uh, that came out last October, talks about the transition from and, and sort of an overstocked grazing system. Uh, driven management to adaptive grazing management. And I'm going to take about five or ten minutes and kind of review that real quick and then get into talking about um, some lessons from that. So Rancho Largo Cat is going to be 14,000 acres, short grass step. It's about 70 miles southeast of Pueblo. I landed there in 1995 without, uh, I had a lot of experience in day to day ranch work and management. 
but, but essentially no experience in strategic long-term decision making, stock and rates, added enterprises, those kinds of things. Uh, so, so the sort of the first approach I took was when you've got pretty high overheads, this is a relatively small ranch, we wanted to support a family pay a mortgage. Uh, we've got to meet our overhead costs. The way we're going to do that is efficiency. We're going to stock right at the, the offer. And, and, and sort of the efficiency and all that. How did that work for us? We're going to see this graph several times. Across the bottom is years starting in 1996. And I'll just get the data plotted for each of those years. The, the red line is, is gross margin cattle. Think of that as cattle profit. And then the blue line is gross margin land, essentially directly correlated to stock rate. So in those early years, when, when I thought I was going to run at the maximum effective stock rate, I was actually overstocked. And, and the fact that the gross margin cattle is negative and downtrending, cattle weren't performing. Gross margin land, the blue line is pretty high, and that green line is precip. Um, so in those years, we had a good precip, but we were, we were overstocked. Uh, neighboring is, is something that I think is common all over the West, where in, uh, in the spring and in the fall, uh, you trade labor with your neighbors. And, and one of the things that, that as, a, as an inexperienced manager that got me over the hump in understanding that I was overstocked was seeing my neighbor's ranches twice a year, especially two guys. Um, this guy, Lloyd Hall, who's now in his 90s, still actively manages a ranch and another guy for Lucas Robbins. The thing I saw about their ranches is that they always had fat cattle, they always had grass. And these are guys who came there with nothing. And, and uh, at that time, 15 years ago, pretty much outrunning owned their ranch and their cattle. You see the same thing with the generational guys. The guys who have been there five generations, those ranches are in good shape. Lloyd's mm -hmm. point, grass makes grass. Uh, we're we're going to talk about that. So, uh, decreased stocking rates. Um, you can see as soon as the blue curve starts coming down, the red curve starts going up. Of course, we had 2002 there, which was a drought year, but all of a sudden our greenbacks went from 80% to 90%, and that's a huge jump. So, just a really fundamental, simple range management relationship. The stocking rate goes down and more. Goes up. But through those three or four years, and, and to some extent I was too dumb to see that we were overstocked, but through those years, I was, those early years, I was also trying to um, change mineral supplements, change feed supplements, change breed to cattle, change calving season, do all these things that, yeah, they're going to get us, we're going to make this high stocking rate work. One of those things that I did was a, a grazing system, and that's a key word, a grazing system. I was moving cattle around thinking that somehow, magically, if I moved them around, uh, it's going to help me run more cattle. And, and what I'm going to talk about now is the transition from the grazing system to the cattle. So on, on the left is the grazing system, where you're just moving cattle around. Then you don't have an ecological goal, you have an economic goal. I want to run into higher stock. The key components of adaptive grazing management are about moving cattle. They're about deciding on an ecological goal. What do you want ecologically? What do you think will improve your ecology? And, and the, the underlying premise is that ecological health will drive profit. For us, we just we did a survey, realized we needed cool season grasses. We were, because of heavy grazing for a long time, we lost cool season grasses. The, the warm season short grasses were dominating. So our goal was to increase cool season grasses. Then what is the ecological process that's that's inhibiting you from having more cool season grasses? And, and this is the, the, this is the a key distinction between a grazing system, which is an application of a grazing protocol, and adaptive management, which is trying to find the key ecological process that you want to have. And, and so for us, we realized that those cool season grasses needed full season defer, and you can't defer the whole range every year during the growing season for cool season grasses. But we figured out with some fences and some thought about how we graze. We could defer essentially two-thirds of the range every year for those cool season grasses. And so we increased our deferral periods. The underlying 
from adaptive management field is plant monitor replant. And so a new business plan based on maximum land health, having a grass reserve, that that's going to drive profits. And, and here's a picture, 1999, which is before we, we began managing adaptively, and then 2008, um, the, the black lines show uh, where Western wheat was recruited. Uh, along with Western wheat, the cool season grasses, we also recruited um, some shrubs that are traditionally decreases in, in, in our environment right there, that's winter fat. I took this picture in the late 90s because I was proud that we had winter fat on our range. We had this little patch, that's the neighbors over there, this is us. The next picture is going to be standing right here looking out away from that. And, and clearly winter fat responded to those long referrals. Uh, another place, riparian areas, draw bottoms respond really well as soon as you uh, find a way to intercede and process with the art. Our uh, species composition in draw bottoms was, was mostly grand grass and filigree. And, and it's, it's along with our western wheat, a whole bunch of mid and tall grasses. Um, in the draw bottoms respond, uh, both warm season and cool season. And so how did that work out economically? So we've looked at these two time periods now. We started the, the process-based adaptive grazing in about 2003. Um, remember that as we decrease stocking rates, this red curve, which is, is gross margin cattle, and this, and I think here I have a part of this, return on investment for cattle, essentially the same thing. Increase in, and I've switched up a little bit over here, but on this right hand side, that brown line is average preset, and the red line is average stocking rate. And the whole point here is that from 2003 to 2012, we ran more cattle on less rainfall and still had good animal performance, still had those 90% conception rates. We were running more cattle than we were running over here when we were in, in a train. And, and, I, and I, how did that happen? I think there's several, several things. I think diversity was a key player, water cycle, and mineral cycle. Uh, so we, when you have cool season grasses and cattle in grazing green grass in October, even in November, in early March, and so that extended grazing season was one of the things that, that translated into dollars. Also, uh, those plants like winter fat that we recruited that are 10 to 12 percent protein in the winter time, uh, those cut your supplement costs. And then finally, the water cycle. Uh, when you recruit mid grasses, this is western wheat around the water tank. Before adaptive grazing, that would have been essentially dirt. You're right next to a water source with some deferral and some pot to help you graze it. Uh, it's cool season grasses, that's one of the places they dry. But the point there is you've got enough residual forage to catch rainfall and, and capture it quickly. It will, it will take a scientist 10 years and lots of money to model and get some control of variables and, and, and get statistics to make some of the points I'm going to make. Now, I may be wrong. There's a high probability I'm wrong because I don't have control, but, but management's kind of the fast and dirty reconnaissance guy, and science get, comes in behind that and, and tells us, kind of cleans up our mistakes. And so after, when, when Brooke did that project, I, I looked in the literature and I couldn't find anything about thresholds related to um, forage and, and rainfall capture. And, and then just in the last couple of weeks, I, I found some papers. And, and what's interesting is they were fighting about it. That threshold that she found, they were arguing about. The guys in, in short grass and mixed grass prairies had figured out, and, and so here's Brooke's line literally residual across the bottom. They have forage production over here. Forage production basically correlates with rainfall capture. You capture more rain, you're going to have. So we're kind of in similar variables. Well, in the, in the short and mixed grass prairie, guys are finding a positive slope for that relationship. As you add more litter, you add more forage production. The guys in the tall grass prairie were finding a negative slope. And, and I think it's the cause of the main. Over here, things are driven, causality is driven by evaporation. Over here, you're catching, you're in that realm where you're catching all the rain you're going to catch. The problem is too much shade. So 
some of those younger plants can't get going. Well, these guys, and, and this is, I think, the key to these causal domains is that Newton can extrapolate as far as he wants. Physicists can extrapolate. In biological systems, you cannot extrapolate outside of the domain where you establish that data empirically. So this argument was caused because these guys were extrapolating their curve over there saying, yeah, it's a positive slope. These guys were extrapolating their curve up there saying, yeah, it's a negative slope. And now they're fighting about it. And, and I think there's a case that the whole sort of raising conflict is, is driven by these kinds of relationships. So a picture of how am I doing for time? I got 25 minutes of it. So uh, just a picture of the water cycle there, bare ground, evaporation is fast, you have some kind of cover, things are better. And, and then, so th this whole water cycle thing, um, threshold thing, water cycle, uh, for a producer, it's about survival. I said at the beginning, paying that mortgage, survival. And, and so when I wrote that Rangelands article, I had this figure in there, and it's kind of a confusing figure, and maybe that's, that's why some of the reviewers didn't like it, but a couple of the reviewers just slapped me in the head and said, this isn't about money. I was like, yeah, it is. <laughs> I, I'm not going to be out there if I don't survive economically. And, and so I battled with them. Ultimately, it did not make the end. But, and, but it is kind of confusing. So what I did was I just divided the stocking rate by precipitation. And this is that same graph from 96 to 2012. Remember I said in these late years, we ran more cattle on less precip. Well, that's why the curve is higher over there than it is over here. We just ran more cattle on less precip. But the, the point is, if you do the math, over here, we were running at $1,500 per centimeter of precipitation, and that's using a $17 per gallon number to value that grazing. Today, that grazing is probably worth twice that. But on our 14,000 acres, that was $21,000 a year on 30 centimeters of precip, 11 to 12 inches of precip. At today's rate, that's more like $45,000 a year. So, so hitting that target of management for those higher residuals um, and having an effective water cycle, that, that is key to making money. And finally, um, plant mortality. Uh, so a threshold that I think I found in the last few years by making mistakes, by grazing too heavily to too low up residuals. So how far can you graze a plant down in a drought without killing? Is the threshold. And most of us have seen this figure a bunch of times. Uh, as you defoliate a plant, you lose root mass. Uh, and, and ultimately, I think in a drought, those roots are, are the last thing the plant holds on to. It'll let the crown die. And I've got a lot of dead grandma crowns out there, but and we'll see some pictures. I think um, some of those roots are still alive. And, and just to tell you my conclusion, and then we'll go through. In places where I grazed blue grandma to below an inch or an inch and a half of residual and did it repeatedly through the drought, very high mortality. Even if I grazed it repeatedly through the drought, if I gave it two inches or more, very low mortality. The, the observations are going to come from one pasture. It's an odd shaped pasture. It's about 800 acres. Uh, there's a water source here and a water source here. Unfortunately, I wasn't smart enough to move the liquid feed source through the drought. It, it bounced around, but generally it stayed between those two water sources. So I had some real uneven grazing, and I noticed this in my monitoring day. A heavily used area here. Down here is the headquarters. Cattle don't like to go there anyhow. That's where they get shipped and weaned and tortured and all that stuff. And so this is an area of avoidance. And the first picture we're going to look at is that area of blatance. Uh, and, and this is July, that's 2013. I don't think I have to be up there. But that's after the drought. But I left, there were in those lightly used areas, there was a pretty high residual. It doesn't look great, but things are holding together there. The crowns of the plants are covered, the soil is covered. Um, then after the rain in 2013, we had those hard rains in late July. Uh, those plants respond. 
And then I took this just the other day, this spring. Those, those, we've had three or four inches of moisture this spring. Uh, again, my cool seasons are doing great. Grounds even starting to come on a little. Those plants are doing fine. Now out here in this area, higher use, uh, you can see crowns are exposed. Um, not, and and that, that threshold of an inch or an inch and a half is, is I think, what those things go over the edge. After it rained, the response was huge. And, and I saw this all over the range. When I killed grandma, and tumbleweeds would be great. That I'm talking about catching raindrops, but they would just stay where they, where they grow. <laughs> and then that's this spring. So, so clearly, dead crowns, I think, and I think I have one more picture. Uh, yeah, so those dead crowns, what I'm seeing this spring and what I saw in places last fall was those roots didn't die. The, the crown is dead, it's going to send up the issue. So in terms of that causal domain thing and discontinuities, uh, what I have on the left is plant mortality. On the bottom is residual plant height for blue grandma. And what I'm saying is you, you have that breaking point at about an inch to an inch and a half where your target is to stay to the right. If you get to the left of that, you're going to have that high mortality. And again, because this, this is so steep, um, for a small increment of management, you get a huge increment of response right at that sweet spot. And so looking at those two things together, uh, as, as a target, so on the left is, is in this gold line, gold bear plant mortality what we just looked at, there's your target. You want to stay to the right of that inch and a half, and you're going to be in that low mortality zone. The, the relationship we looked at earlier, um, and, and this is, I, mean, I call it a resilience target because I was, there was, the last three years, my grandma grass plants didn't grow three inches tall. So there's no way I could get to there unless I didn't graze at all. And, and you know, maybe we're going to look at the numbers again in a second. Maybe that was, would have been a better option. But, that's that zone where in the good years you're building resilience. You're building root mass in the plant, bigger in the plants. That water cycle, that $20,000 a year I showed in water cycle. By hitting that target, um, then when the drought does come along, you're building that resilience. And so those three pastures, coming back to the, to the money numbers on those three pastures. Pasture number one, my gross was 1367 per acre. I grazed it all three years of the drought to a low residual, and I'm in that 78% mortality. The power, I think, of these thresholds and managing towards the threshold is right here, this pattern number two. $12.12 in those three years. Grazed two out of the three years. Gave it a full year off. Grazed 011, not 012. Grazed again in 013 to a higher residual than that first pasture. Only a $1.50 difference in income, but look where I am ecologically. I hit that target. And, and, and then that third pasture, if you want to be cautious, if you have resilience in money and you don't need that income, and we saw how with the rain, that third pasture just, just exploded with the rain. Only had $1.87 of income over those three years, but ecologically, I was almost over there building some resilience. Raised it one out of the three years of the drought. And, and I'll be able to Two or three years from now, when I get a chance to watch how these pastures respond, if we ever get out of this drought, I'll be able to answer the question. I, I don't think that's a good scenario. I think mean, one of these two is the best scenario, but I don't know what's wrong with that. And so finally, um, I think we can be proactive about weather events, and, and these extremes, weather things that we're experiencing, may be the new norm. And, and so, Building resilience into our business and into our ecosystem, uh, I think, is key. Uh, that resilience is essentially diversity and some redundancy. Causal domains, uh, and I think this is, is ultimately in complex systems, this causal domain thing is a powerful tool for a manager. And, and I think it, it can help us avoid some of the conflicts between management and science. I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you.
99 to 2000 is when we built most of our fence, and we went from nine pastures to 36 pastures. Our pastures average about 400 acres. And I, but I think, you know, the, the pasture number stuff, you could do a lot with five or six. It, it, ultimately, having 36 helps me. It gives me more options. And, and I don't, do we have this? Okay, I don't plan my grazing annually. A lot of a lot of people sit down with a chart and plan their grazing for a year, and, and they figure out if I've got 36 pastures, I'm going to build some of those pastures. I, I adapt it out of that method, and the way I do it now is I plan it three times a year, and I essentially do it the way most guys do in the fall. So in the fall, most ranchers go out there and they say, "Okay, here's how much forage I have. I need to get from November to green grass." I've got 200 cows here who have enough forage to do that. Because they know nothing's going to grow. And, and so I took that method of assuming no growth, and I, I now apply that in March and I apply it in June. So I go out there in March, and if we've had huge snows, that's kind of my exception to the no growth rule. If I've had three foot of snow, I know I'm going to have cool season grasses. But I plan and if no moisture's coming. And so my planning process is first I go around the ranch. I don't say how long has it been since that pasture has been grazed. I go look at that pasture and say, have the plants recovered? Because it, recovery isn't time. Recovery is a plant physiological thing where that plant needs to go to seed before I graze it. And so I go look at my 36 pastures. I say, okay, 12 of them are recovered. Now I've got 200 cows here and I need to make it three months. Can I make it? Is there enough forage in those pastures? If the answer is yes, I go right on. No, I get rid of some cap. That's why I made the transition from straight cow cap. If and, and then the third option is if I got extra forage, I can either use it now, I can take in some cattle, I can buy some calf, buy some gear, or I can save it and use it some call for the And I think the biggest mistake I made in the drought, by the way, was departing from that planning process. That planning process, forage availability dictates your grazing plan. In the drought, I got the, got caught. I bought in the first two years of the drought, and I was resilient. I had a chance to buy some cows. I bought the cows, thinking this was going to be a one-year drought deal. I let those. I should have probably sold at least some of those cows sooner than I did. I was going to make a windfall on them if the drought would ever end, but the drought went on for three years, and, and there was a point there where I let ownership of cattle drive my grazing plants instead of vice versa. You know, I do, and, and I'd be happy to share that with anybody. It's, it's, I've shown it to a few people, and they just look at it and shake their head. But the, the three key components that I use are that visual inspection. Are the plants recovered? My goal is species inspection. Are they recovered? And then two, the, the whole seasonality thing is absolutely critical. So the chart I use, it's color-coded, and for each pasture, it shows for a three-year time period, going back three years, when that pasture was grazed, and, and it's basically spring, fall, summer, during the season. And then I have a transition, so I have five seasons, basically, based on what the cattle are eating those different seasons. So I, I can kind of look at that. If it's a spring graze, I'm going to read the season grasses, and I'm going to season grasses. But that chart gives me a three-year history of each pasture. And so I have, right next to that chart, then I have the 12 pastures that are ready, I can look over and say, okay, that one was grazed. Last time it was grazed was last June, and we're in June now, so I ain't going back. He just got off the list, now I got 